things some more, but we do want to go ahead and get the event started. Uh, so I wanted to uh, take this opportunity to um, give you a quick introduction. Um, my name is Kevin Loretto. I'm the uh, Director of Sales for Creative Stage Lighting. And I wanted to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to the uh, premier Creative Stage Lighting webinar event, uh, the future of live event and performing arts um, industry. And uh, thank you for attending. Uh, this is the first in our series of webinars. Uh, the goal is to uh, keep you informed on the state of our industry and its changing landscape, as well as to provide you with information on the latest technologies and trends affecting the entertainment lighting business. Uh, future events will include a focus on digital lighting and converging technologies, a webinar regarding uh, how LEDs are changing the face of both entertainment lighting and architainment, uh, the future of wireless technology in the live event marketplace, and a broad range of other topics um, affecting all our futures. Uh, we have an event section on the Creative Stage Lighting website where we'll be keeping you posted on upcoming events and dates. Uh, so please make sure that uh, you check that out regularly, and we'll also make sure we keep you all in the queue via email. Uh, you can check that out at uh, www.creativestagelighting.com. Uh, during the course of this webinar, you'll have the opportunity to participate in uh, several polls uh, to get your input on some of the topics that Richard will be speaking with us about, as well as a questionnaire at the end to get your feedback on what you'd like to see in future events. Uh, as you, you're already aware, uh, today's guest speaker is Richard Kadena. Uh, Richard has been in the entertainment lighting industry since 1986. Uh, many of you know him as the editor of PLSN Magazine, and as such, he has his finger on the pulse of the industry. Uh, Richard is a, a portal for industry news and information, and talks regularly with the movers and shakers in our business. He's written three books, Automated Lighting, The Art and Science of Moving Light, Focus on Lighting Technology, and Lighting Design for Modern Houses of Worship. In addition, Richard is a certified entertainment electrician and a recognized ECC trainer, as well as a freelance lighting designer specializing in green design. So he's very familiar with the issues that we're all dealing with on a daily basis. So if you would all now please join me in welcoming Richard Kadeen. Richard? Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that. And also, thank you, a big thank you to Creative Stage Lighting for inviting me to do this. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for being here. And uh, I hope you will check out the entire Creative Stage Lighting webinar series. I think it's going to be really good. So today's topic, you know, I just got back from the Plaza Trade Show in London. And while I was there, I went to an industry party. And I overheard these four guys talking about the live event production industry. One of them said, you know, I have a friend in the industry who makes $750 a day. That's pretty good, isn't it? And the next guy goes, oh, yeah? What does he do? The first guy says, well, he's an automated lighting programmer. Another guy speaks up and he says, hmm, that's not bad. You know, but I have a friend in the industry who makes about $1,000 a day. The first guy says, really, what does he do? And he said, he's a lighting designer. Then another guy spoke up and he goes, hey, you know, that's nothing. I, I have a friend who makes well over $2,500 a day. The first guys say, wow, that's impressive. What does he do? And he said, you know, he does the exact same thing I do, except his business card says he's a consultant. Can you really make $2,500 a day in this industry? There are really people out there who do it. But the question is, how do you get there? Now, one of the main things that I'd like for you to take away from this webinar is the idea that you control your own future. It's not your boss. It's not your colleagues. It's not what you've done in the past, but it's what you can do in the future. And uh, there are certain things that influence our current economic state and technological environment, but that's also how opportunity is created and lost. So some of the things we're going to be talking about today are the current economic economic environment and how it can impact your career. Uh, we're going to talk about career options that are available to you, how much money you can expect to make, what the emerging technologies are and the opportunities they bring, and most importantly, how can you best prepare for your future in the live event production industry. Now before we begin, I'd like for you to take a moment to think about and set your intentions. I'd like for you to visualize your career goal in your head. Think about it. Make it realistic and attainable, something that you really want to do or really want to become. And I would like for you to write it down right now in the form of a question, something such as, how can I become an ETCP certified rigger? 
or how can I become a lighting designer or whatever. I'd like for you to write that down on a piece of paper right now. While you're thinking about that, I'll tell you a little bit about my own career path in the lighting industry. You know, I used to work for a big lighting manufacturer for about 13 years, and I made a really comfortable living. And in November of 1996, my wife and I were blessed with a beautiful baby daughter. About a year later, I was laid off. Now, fortunately, I found a new job in the industry right away and uh, subsequently bought a new home in July of 1998. And in August of 1999, I was laid off again. So I started a new business selling lighting gear in December of that year. And, you know, it was going pretty well up until 9-11 and then the bottom dropped out, and that pretty much put an end to the business. So suddenly I found myself with a new baby, a new mortgage, and no income. It was a pretty, honestly, it was a scary feeling. But after that, I vowed to become layoff proof, and I did everything in my power to figure out how to do that. In March 2003, I published my first book, Focus on Lighting Technology, and today I'm working on my fourth book, uh, which will be called Electricity for Entertainment, Electricians, and Technicians. It will be out in March of 2009. So now I have a certain amount of security knowing that should anything happen to my job, I do have options. And honestly, that's the best security you can have in any, any economic situation, and that is to have options. So let's talk about how you can create more options for your own developing career. Now, by this time, I hope that you have written down your intentions on a piece of paper. And uh, during the course of this webinar, I, I would encourage you to ask questions, or at least write them down and save them for the end. Um, and I think it's the reason I'm asking you to do this, I think it's really important to get in the habit of asking questions and drop your inhibitions about asking questions. Because the one thing I've learned after extensive research in this industry is that no one knows everything, right? So you can rest assured that when you ask a question, there's probably somebody else in the room who wants to know the exact same thing, and nobody's going to be shocked or point fingers at you because they think you're ignorant. You know, we're all ignorant about one thing or another. The, Benjamin Disraeli, the former prime minister of the U.K., once said, the fool wonders, the wise man asks. So let's talk about the world around us. There are are certain factors that are heavily influencing our industry today. First of all, we live in a global village in, uh, where communication and collaboration around the world is very simple and inexpensive, and the competition, honestly, is very intense. Secondly, we're in the midst of a population explosion, and that translates to an increased supply of labor and brain power. And that means that any job you want is likely to be heavy, heavily pursued and uh, you have to do something to counter that. And lastly, we live in exponential times where technology is really changing at a rapid pace. The global village is a, is a, is a term coined by Wyndham Lewis in his book, America and the Cosmic Man, in 1948. But it was popularized by Marshall McLuhan in his, in his book, The Gutenberg Galaxy, The Making of Typographic Man. Um, the book describes how electronic mass media have broken down the barriers in both time and space and allow people to interact and collaborate on a global scale, and that's exactly what's going on right now. Um, and if you, if you find that hard to believe, then I would invite you to visit www.yourmanindia.com or Brickwork India, and that address is at www.b2kcorp.com. Com. Those are some real eye-openers to visit those websites. We're also currently experiencing a population explosion. As of July 1, 2007, U.S. Census Bureau estimated the world population to be over 6.6 .6 billion people. And if you look at this chart, you'll see how the population started growing exponentially around 1800s. In 1965, Intel co-founder Gordon Moore observed that computers have doubled in power every 18 to 24 months. And that trend has held true for over 50 years, and we expect that to continue into the future. 
Futurist Ray Kurzweil projects that Moore's Law will continue at least until 2019, and that transistors and integrated circuits at that time will be only a few atoms in width. Um, we're also, uh, you know, everybody's painfully aware of the rising cost of fuel, and it's affecting any, everything in our industry, including how we uh, design our lighting systems. It's raising the price of everything, and it's only going to get worse. And I think that green lighting design is going to be a big field in the coming years. So um, while you consider all that, let me give you some more things to think about. Now, these are things that I took from Scott Adams' uh, PowerPoint. You may have seen it on the Internet called Did You Know? Uh, if you're one in a million in China, there are 1,300 people just like you. In India, there are 1,100 people just like you. The 25% of the population in China with the highest IQs is greater than the total population of North America. In India, it's the top 28%. Translation, they have more smart people than we have people. China will soon become the number one English-speaking country in the world. If you took every single job in the U.S. today and shipped it to China, China would still have a labor surplus. In the next eight minutes, 60 babies will be born in the U.S., 244 babies will be born in China, and 351 babies will be born in India. The U.S. Department of Labor estimates that today's learner will have 10 to 14 jobs by the age of 38. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, one out of four workers today is working for a company they have been employed by for less than one year. More than one out of two people who are working for, are working for a company they have worked for for less than five years. According to former Secretary of Education Richard Riley, the top 10 fields, the 10 top jobs in 2010 did not exist in 2004. We're currently preparing people for jobs that don't exist using technologies that haven't been invented in order to solve problems we didn't even know are problems yet. Name this country, richest in the world, largest military, center of world business and finance, strongest education system, world center of innovation and invention, currency the world standard of value, the highest standard of living. That country, England, in 1900, or China, in the Ming Dynasty, or it could have been Rome, or Greece, or who knows what it, what it might be in the future. The point is we're living in exponential times. There are about 540,000 words in the English language, about five times as many as during Shakespeare's time. More than 3,000 new books are published every single day. It's estimated that a week's worth of New York Times contains more information than a person was likely to come across in a lifetime in the 18th century. It's estimated that 40 exabytes, that's four with 19 zeros behind it, so 40 exabytes of unique new information was generated worldwide in 2004. That's estimated to be more than the previous 5,000 years. The amount of new technical information was doubling every two years in 2005. The amount of new technical information is thought to have doubled every two years in 2006. And the amount of new technical information in 2010 is predicted to double every 72 hours. It's mind-blowing. So let's talk about the live event production industry. Here's a picture that shows the live event production universe as we know it. There are lots of different types of organizations, which means that there are lots of different options for employment in this industry. But to maximize these options, you need to be aware of them. For example, here's a representation of a live event production company and some of the different jobs that might exist within that organization. As you can see, there's three different tiers. In the bottom tier are unskilled, la uh, unskilled positions. In the second tier are the more skilled laborers. And in the top tier, you have the more creative, professional, and higher paying positions. Notice that as you go toward the top of the pyramid, 
there are more people competing for fewer jobs. So if you think that you can skate into one of these positions with a lot of, with, without a lot of hard work or sacrifice, then think again. Richard, this might be a good place where we could uh, talk about one of the polls. We've got a, a little poll here about what's your current job or profession, and that'll kind of give us a better viewpoint of the audience and, uh, and where we're going as we, as we move down there. Great so basically, idea, uh, we've, got a, we've got a poll here that's what's your current job or profession? Uh, your choices are business owner or manager, rigor electrician, stagehand, lighting designer or lighting programmer, shop tech or service tech, or consultant or freelancer. So if all of you could just uh, cast your votes so we have a better idea of, uh, of who all the audience is, uh, that'll, that'll make it helpful and uh, we'll give you some idea of the results. Okay, and um, we'll just give it a couple of seconds to let people... Yeah, they're still uh, voting. We've got uh, 66... 70, we're getting close to 100% of the vote here, so. Okay. And I think that pretty much we've got most of the people who are going to vote on that. Um, so our results are basically um, business owner and manager, we've got 42%. Rigor electrician or stagehand, 24%. Lighting designer or lighting programmer, 55%. Shop tech or service tech, 11, and consultant or freelancer, uh, 29%. Okay. Is that about 300%? That's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess we have some overlap there. I guess we've got some people that are that are actual multiples. So. Yeah. Okay. So uh, here's another example. We'll move on now. Here's another example. We're now we're talking about a live event technology manufacturer. Uh, again, there's three levels of skill. The higher paying jobs are the ones that require uh, not only more skill but also more creativity. Um, then, um, let's see, did we miss a slide here? No, I guess we didn't. Okay. So do we want to do the poll now, uh, the other poll, Kevin, the next poll? Yeah, we can do that. Uh, the, other, the other question is, um, how much are you currently earning? Um, basically, what we're, uh, Richard's going to give you some idea in terms of earning potential in this business. Um, you can select any that apply, uh, less than 50000 50 to 100000 or more than 100000 and, and this Again, is confidential now, so we're not going to... Yeah, right. We're not, we're we're not, not counting who's polling what. Right. Exactly. We're just trying to get an overview of things. So let's wait while that poll fills up. Yep. Yeah, we've got, uh, we've got about 75% participating. Now there's actually more participating in this one than did the first round. We're up to about 80% of everybody that's voting here. Right. Okay. And that looks right. like, uh, like we're good there. Yep. All right. We'll, we'll share the results with you. Uh, basically, we've got 40% uh, that say that uh, they're under 50,000. We've got 38% that say they're in the 50 to $100,000 range. And we've got 19% that say they're in the more than 100,000 range. So that'll uh, you know, give you some idea as we go further into this. And Richard touch, uh, touches a little bit more on earning potential, uh, you know, some directions you uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, what are some of the reasons that people want to advance their career in this industry? Well, of course, there's always monetary reasons. If you want to earn more money, then you should ask yourself who exactly the top earners in our industry are. Um, how do you get into this six-figure club? Or, you know, who are the people earning $100,000 or more? Well, you have the, uh, the top designers in our industry can certainly do that. Uh, that, that means lighting designers, scenic designers, production designers. You know, I once asked a friend of mine who's a, a, a top lighting designer what his day rate is. He told me it's $5,000 per day plus first class travel. So now he's, he's on the top end of that, but uh, that, you know, there's, your, there's your top end potential. Um, you have consultants, engineers, uh, front of house engineers, electrical engineers, structural engineers make pretty good money. Uh, if you're a a sales rep, you certainly have that potential. When I was a sales rep uh, for a manufacturer, I was making six figures in 1990. So that gives you an idea. Uh, the top managers, production managers, touring ma tour, tour managers, sales managers, those guys all have the ability to earn good money. And of course, if you're a business owner, then the sky's the limit as far as your earnings potential. So, but notice that the more risk you take, the more money that, you're, that you are liable to make. Uh, freelance people generally make more money than their, counter, than their uh, captive counterparts, and business owners make more money than employees because they carry more risk. So what about the, the next tier, which is what, what I would call the high five club, people who are earning salaries in the high five figures. 
they can be uh, some good, you know, good designers, some account reps or salespeople, uh, managers, engineers, console programmers, and top Turing techs. Then you have the My Life Sucks Because I Don't Make Enough Money Club. These people include some designers, perhaps designers who are just starting out or are in the wrong situation. Uh, you have some account reps with not so hot selling products or services. You have unskilled labor, and then people who are generally unmotivated to advance in their career. Now, we, you know, we've been talking about monetary reasons. There are also many non-financial reasons that you might want to advance your career. Uh, some people are more highly motivated by personal satisfaction th that we get from our jobs than by money. And you know, if your job gives you goosebumps bump from time to time, then you're likely to be uh, very satisfied with your job. There's also the travel factor. It, it, you know, it, it, I've observed that, pe that most people in this industry under 30 are looking for ways to go on the road and most people who are over 30 are looking for ways to come off the road and still make the kind of money that they made while they're on the road. There's also a creativity factor. You know, some people just have a creative urge. Um, I personally like to write, and uh, I like art. You know, so I feel very fortunate to be able to get paid to write and do lighting design as well. And lastly. Uh, increasing and sharpening your job skills will give you more career options, and therefore you will have more job security. If you lost your job today, ask yourself, what marketable skills do I have that would help me find a job tomorrow? So having skills that are in demand in the marketplace is really the best form of job security that you can have today. So that begs the question, how do you move up the career ladder and up the pay scale? So. Regardless of where you are right now in your career, there are concrete things that you can do, there are actions you can take to increase the odds that you will move up the career ladder. One of those keys is to increase your productivity. If you're making money for your employer, for the guy that writes your paycheck, then chances are that more doors will open for you. So we want to consider ways to increase your personal productivity. The people in this industry who make the most money are the ones who are happiest in their jobs, and they're typically people who are working from their neck up rather than from their neck down. So the way to move in that direction is to develop or enhance those skills that utilize your brain, whatever its size. If your goal is to advance your career, then you should consider ways to move away from manual labor and more into mental labor. Um, you know, manual labor like pushing road cases, uh, stocking inventory, those types of things, uh, whereas mental labor is CAD design, rendering, management, engineering, those types of things. Now, as your career progresses, you not only have to sharpen your existing skills, but you have to add new skills because the, the uh, production landscape is rapidly changing and it demands that you keep up. Uh, all of these skills you see are marketable skills that can help you make more money and increase your own job security. Now, we've been talking a lot about particular job skills that can help you in a career, but you may wonder how you, as an aspiring young professional, can acquire new skills or sharpen existing skills that fit into these exponential times. Well, there are many ways to do this. Some people walk straight into the industry out of high school, and they're wor they work their way up through brute force. If you choose that path, then you've got to rely on on-the-job training, and you, you really need to put in some overtime studying and building a foundation for your career. Uh, there are other people who go to technical school and uh, get a foundation that might allow them to start out in a second-tier job. Um, of course, if you have the resources to go to college and university, that's probably the best option. And you could potentially start out in a top-tier job, but even that's not a given. So the traditional way of advancing your career is by working for the same company and working your way up through the ranks, but really that's becoming more of a rarity. It used to be that you could go to work for a company and rely on that job for most or if not all of your career, but today more of the responsibility for your own career rests on your own shoulders. So a more typical scenario today is a person who advances their career by shifting from one company to the next, one job to the next. You know, according to an article in Economist ma
Magazine in October 2007, the average job tenure in America is four years. But even shifting jobs doesn't guarantee that you'll end up in a better career position. Now, a lot of times, uh, when you change jobs, you have to uproot your family and relocate geographically. And there are times when that pays off, but there are also times when the new job doesn't work out. But either way, it's, it's going to be a gamble. So regardless of whether or not you relocate or change jobs uh, locally, the typical career goes something like this. As your skills increase, you make more connections in the industry, then you'll typically rise up the pay scale, climb the career ladder, provided that you can get along with people and prove to be a valuable asset. Let's look at how you might accelerate that career path, take some shortcuts. So uh, you can short circuit the learning curve by taking advantage of training opportunities like the Creative Stage Lighting webinars. Um, and you know, today there are a lot of uh, options for job-specific training, and we'll talk more about some of those options a little bit later on. Now there's always the super accelerated career path. That's where you happen to have gone to primary school with a super rock star like Bono or Madonna, and you ride, ride their coattails all the way to the top. But unfortunately, that option is not exactly available to all of us. Now I did a little poll. I polled several designers about their own career paths, and here's some information that I found out. Willie Williams ran away with the punk band, and that's how he became a lighting designer. Today he is the lighting designer for U2 and a lot of other bands. He's an excellent lighting designer, but he basically uh, worked his way up from, from the bottom. Howard Ungerleiter, the lighting designer for Rush for 30 years now, um, left co or finished college, went to work uh, for American Talent International as a uh, talent scout, and that's how he found the band Rush, and he's been with them ever since. Patrick Dearson is a young upcoming lighting designer who uh, started out as a nightclub lighting console operator and he worked his way up from there. Now he's, he's, he's been working for Shakira, for the Rolling Stones, for Live Earth. He's doing very well. Seth Jackson, who works for uh, Barry Manilow, Hilary Duff, Toby Keith, a lot of other people. Uh, he used to be a, a DJ, a um, lighting DJ, and he, but he did go to college. Uh, and he, he went to work for Verilight and became a lighting program or, uh, programmer and then a lighting designer. Benny Kirkham now works for the Dixie Chicks, Elton John, Anger Management. He had a long uh, climb, ascend to the top, but uh, he, he worked his way as a, a Verilight technician, and now, of course, he's a lighting designer. But, you know, uh, that was then, and this is now, and a lot of things have changed since uh, some of these people uh, got into the lighting industry. Um, there are a lot of new emerging technologies that are really changing the industry as we know it. There's LEDs, media servers. There are uh, n new networking and wireless devices, battery technology, digital luminaires, and of course there's that issue of energy efficiency. Um, you know, if it wasn't that long ago that nobody in the industry really used LEDs, and they're virtually unheard of in our industry. But today, you can hardly find a show that isn't using them. I mean, and some shows literally have millions of LEDs. But and, and why is that? That's because LEDs have doubled in brightness every 18 to 24 months for the past 40 years, and there's no really no reason to believe that that trend will not continue in the future. This chart shows the doubling of growth of lumens per device since the 1960s when, when LEDs were invented. If you look at the, um, the bottom chart there, you'll see the projected lumens per watt compared to incandescent and fluorescent lamps, and you'll understand why we're about to enter a new phase in LEDs, and that is when LEDs are uh, more efficient than some of the other alternative uh, light sources we've been using. Now, over the past few years, media servers have become ubiquitous. It, I mean, you, you can hardly go to a show anymore that doesn't have a lot of video driven by at least one media server, and, and a lot of shows have more than that. For example, the opening ceremonies of the games of the 29th Olympiad in Beijing, Beijing this year had one single projection surface that was 4,000 square meters. That's 43,000 square feet, and they used 120 media servers 
to accomplish that. Networking has also become very important, and it's a growing part of our production environment, and that's, there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, uh, control systems started getting, started getting more complex, starting with uh, memory consoles in the 70s, and then automated lighting increased the channel count roughly by a factor of 10 in the 80s. The, but the, over time, the increased acceptance of automated lighting and the falling prices of automated lighting have resulted in much larger lighting rigs with much higher channel counts. And of course, the introduction of LEDs and pixel mapping have led to a, a real explosion in the channel count. So now, rigs are so big with so many channels that some of them require multi-user programming, where one programmer is assigned an, one area of the rig and several programmers work together to complete the programming for a single event. And networking technology is the key to making it easier and affordable to put together these extensive systems. And again, the, the opening ceremonies in Beijing had 23,000 DMX devices. That's, that's lights. And 45,000 parameters controlled by 96 universes of DMX. One universe of DMX, of course, is 512 channels. Wireless technology is another uh, emerging technology that's expanding uh, our possibilities in production. I recently spoke to Rick Baxter, who is the master electrician on Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and he told me that when he worked uh, in the pre-production phase of that show on Broadway, that all the various departments involved in that production, that means lighting, audio, projection, special effects, they had to have production meetings to negotiate frequencies between themselves. That's how much wireless is on that show. And, it's, and that's, that's not unusual. It's a growing trend that will continue for a long time. And as a result of all of this wireless technology, there's an increased use of battery technology because wireless and battery technology go hand in hand. Uh, to give you an example, at the Phantom of the Opera in Las Vegas, there's 90 pounds of batteries in the chandelier that falls from the ceiling. And there's a 450-pound battery for the lightning strikes strobe in the dome. Uh, and last year, energy efficiency became a real hot button issue when Assemblyman uh, Levine in California introduced legislation in California to ban the incandescent bulb. And that really set off a chain reaction all over the world. And in the end, there were proposals for similar legislation in New Jersey, Connecticut, Canada, Australia, and the European Union. Uh, but the, the real thing that spurred this movement, there were a number of factors. There's the rising cost of fuel, the impact of hydrocarbons on the ecology, there's the depletion of our natural resources, and there's increased awareness of all of these factors. And of course, now that there's no, new, more efficient technologies available, now we can put them to, to good use. And the bottom line is that the, this industry is becoming more and more complex. We've gone from conventional lighting and present day visual uh, or, or from conventional lighting to present-day visual presentation over the past 25 years. And, and all along the way, we've picked up and gotten more complex. We went from computerized control. We've added automated lighting. We've added digital audio, digital luminaires, media servers, network systems. And so you see where that, that trend is going. And all of these new technologies bring with them new challenges. We're facing an, a, a real increase in the pace of technological acceleration. Uh, along with it comes a plethora of new standards like DMX 512A, RDM, ACN, streaming DMX, TI, uh, CITP. Um, and uh, speaking of those standards, Kevin, can we do a poll to find out how many of the attendees um, are familiar with these standards? Sure. Kevin? Yep. Go ahead and get that launched for you. Okay. So okay. basically, um, which of the following technologies are you familiar with? And you can select any or all that apply. Again, as Richard said, uh, DMX 512A, RDM, APN, streaming DM, DMX, or CITP. I'll give you a couple of minutes to complete your vote. Oops. And it's going to be one of those, Richard, where we have a lot more than 100% in total, because there's a lot of people that are familiar with DMX 512, and then right. falls off from there. OK. So we'll give you It'll be interesting to see what the results are. Yeah. We have a real good participation in that poll. About 86% of the people voted. And basically, um, the results that came back 
Uh, DMX 512A at 88% are familiar with that technology, 40% with RDM, 42% with ACN, 26% with streaming DMX, and 9% with CITP. Well, I'm surprised that people know about CITP. That's a new one. Well, great. That's very good. That's about what I expected except for that last one. Okay, so to continue, um, along with all of these uh, comes a, a whole diverse set of technologies. Now we have Ethernet, we have ArtNet, Passport. There's all kinds of video standards, and those, uh, those standards are still in flux. For example, what exactly is high, def uh, high definition? What, uh, you know, what does that mean? Uh, there's also resolution issues. There's media formats, compression schemes, and all these related issues. We also have several new infrastructures to deal with, like fiber optics, CAT5, CAT6. Uh, there's 802.11a, b, c, d, e, f, and g. And you know, it's just not going to get any simpler from here. Um, but of course, with every challenge also comes opportunity. The, um, in addition to the conventional type of jobs that we've been talking about, there are a number of new positions that we don't even know about yet. And therein, I think, lies your best opportunity for advancing your career in this industry. In the near future, uh, we're going to need more designers who understand how to produce energy efficient designs. We need programmers who can work with the team on a network. We need more content developers. We need tour IT technicians. Um, we need production designers who can integrate lighting and video. So the question is, what's a struggling middle class working live entertainment production professional to do? Well, first of all, read. Now, a lot of you are going, yeah, sure, where am I going to have time to read? I don't have time to read. Uh, this is an interesting uh, quote here. Al Gore from his book, Assault on Reason, says that Americans now watch television an average of four, and a, four hours and 35 minutes a day. So I'm guessing, yeah, if we can turn off the TV, we can probably find some time to read. Now, what would happen if you just were to spend one hour a day working on advancing your own career? Well, if you read, write, research, um, and practice your ideal profession, you can do a lot. Uh, between the, the years of 2003, 2006, by spending one day, one hour a day uh, writing, reading, and researching, I wrote the book, Automated Lighting, the Art and Science of Moving Light. Now, if, uh, if you need help finding things to read, here are some good resources. You can read trade magazines. There's a whole bunch of them out there. There's technical books. You can find them at plsnbookshelf.com. There are lots of related books and articles. Some of my favorites are Empires of Light by Jill Johns about the war of currents between Edison, Tesla, and Westinghouse, Overcurrents and Undercurrents by Earl Roberts, and uh, I'm sure there's a whole lot more out there. But the important thing is to keep your skills current and to develop new skills. There's a, a lady named Penelope Trunk who uh, is an author, and she recently said in an interview, in order to succeed in the workplace, you really have to be an amazingly productive person, and I'd have to agree with that. Um, also, don't underestimate the value of getting along. The same author, Penelope Trunk, said, there's been a big shift in the workplace. We now have data to show that people would rather work with somebody who is nice and incompetent than with somebody who is a complete jerk. And in our industry, that holds doubly true because we have to share close quarters on the bus. We have to spend long hours with the same crew. And you know, you'd really uh, uh, do well to get along with people. Now, one of the easiest ways that I know of to get ahead in this business is to follow this recommended practice. It's real simple. Listen twice as much as you talk. Think twice as much as you listen. You can also sharpen your skills by learning new software. And there's a whole bunch of um, software programs uh, listed there that can help you. And don't, again, this is really important. I stress this. Don't forget to read as much as you can because technology is changing rapidly. But here's the thing. If you really under, want to understand all these emerging technologies, you have to have a good grasp of the fundamentals because some things 
like mass and physics never change. You know, the speed of light will always be 186,000 miles per second. Ohm's law will always be V equals IR. Luminance will always be the luminous flux divided by the square of the throw distance. And energy will always equals equal mass times the speed of light squared. So, Richard, we, we, um, we did have that question that you wanted to ask about uh, applications that people are conversant with. Okay. So that would be probably a good time to bring that in. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that poll, and I'm going to go back up to that. Well, I guess I don't need to because you've got them on the poll, but here, yep. here's most of the software applications. So we want to ask you guys out there and girls, um, which of these software programs are you familiar with? Now, they're not all listed on the poll, but uh, yeah, basically we list Illustrator, Photoshop, AutoCAD, ESP Vision, and 3D Studio Max. Uh, yeah, those are, a lot of them. those are the ones that are probably most applicable to our industry, especially Vectorworks, LD Assistant, WYSIWYG, ESP Vision. So go ahead and complete that poll. Let me know, Kevin, when we're when we're good yep. to go. Yeah, we're up to about 85 percent, and that seems to be about the the number that we normally have in voters. So let's close that poll. Okay. And I'll share the results with you. Uh, basically, uh, we've got 73% uh, that say they're familiar with both Photoshop and AutoCAD. 36% um, are familiar with Illustrator, 14% with ESP Vision, and 9% with 3D Studio Max. Okay, well, I would encourage you guys to, uh, to look more at the lighting design software and visualization. So. All right, so getting back here, uh, the bottom line is I, I think that uh, taking advantage of training uh, really would, will really pay off. Of course, Creative Stage Lighting is offering this series of webinars. I would highly recommend uh, going to www.creativestagelighting.com, sign up for the seminar, the webinars that are coming up. There are a lot of other opportunities for training around the country. There's seminars out there. Trade shows are a great source of information and training. A lot of and a lot of manufacturers uh, host their own training seminars. If you're a member of IOTC, then you probably have variety, uh, an, uh, access to a variety of training options. And of course, if you're really serious about your career, then think about taking a class or getting your degree at a local college or university. You know, it's, uh, I think one of the important things here is to embrace change, uh, regardless of what you do in the industry. I think you should have a computer if you don't already own one. There's really no reason not to have one. They're very affordable these days. They're very powerful. I would suggest building your own website. Learn to use some of the software tools to help you do that. And um, here's a list of some of the software tools that uh, you might be interested in. You know, Abraham Lincoln once said, I will prepare and someday my chance will come. Now, you know, a professional football player puts in over 1,000 hours of preparation for less than 100 hours of performance. Michael Phelps practiced two to five hours a day for years before he ever got to spend his, uh, I think it was something like an hour and 20 minutes in the pool total to get his eight medals. So my question to you is, just exactly how much preparation do you put in for your own job? Think about that, okay? And if you're really serious about your career, then I want you to take these steps. Starting right now, I'd like for you to commit your goal to paper. Print it out on certificate paper, frame it, hang it on the wall in your office. Okay. Uh, find a mentor, somebody who can help you figure out how to advance in your career, and set aside at least one hour a day to work towards your goal. And I recommend that you do it first thing in the morning because if you do that, then no matter what else happens the rest of the day, you'll have already done something to advance your career. And I know from experience that if you wait until the afternoon or evening, then all sorts of unexpected things will pop up and conspire to interrupt or take away that hour that you set aside for that purpose. So the key here is to plan your work and really work your plan. This is a picture of the certificate that I printed out. I framed and I hung it on my office wall right after 9-11 and right before I wrote Automated Lighting the Art and Science of Moving Light. You know, um, do I think I'm a world-renowned author and one of the world's leading experts in the field? Of course not. Do I aspire to it? Absolutely. Every single day I aspire to it. Um, so um, I'd like for you to, to take these steps. If, you, if you're serious about advancing your career, you can take these steps right now. 
if you want to become a production electrician, then I would suggest that you stock your library. Here are some suggestions. Find a mentor, get a vol or volunteer for a part-time job, uh, read the ETCP Candidate Handbook, and take a training seminar. If you want to be a lighting technician, then stock your library with these books. Find a mentor, volunteer, read the ETCP Candidate Handbook, and build a resume. If you want to be a lighting programmer, stock your library with these books. Find a mentor, volunteer, download offline editors and practice every day, buy a visualizer, use it, build your resume, and take a console programming seminar. If you want to be a lighting designer, here are some good books that you should have. Find a mentor, volunteer, buy a lighting CAD program, build a portfolio, and take a lighting design seminar. If you want to be a front of house engineer, here are some good book recommendations. Again, find a mentor, volunteer, buy a small PA and practice every single day, build your resume. If, you're, if you want to be a rigger, then here are some books that you should have. Find a mentor to help you out. Volunteer, take rigging seminars, and build your resume. And if you're on the road and you want to get off the road, then um, these are some little bit different kind of books, uh, but these books will help you. And uh, you should write a resume. And by all means, get some business cards. Find a headhunter and network with all your friends. Pass out your, re your resume at trade shows. Okay. So before we go, I want to leave you with this. I was uh, taking a cab to the airport recently, and I was chatting with the driver on the way. When we got to the airport, I handed him my credit card, and he slid it through his machine. While we were waiting for the transaction to go through, he looked at me and pointed at the machine and said, that thing, that put me out of business. I said, excuse me? He said, that machine, that computer right there, that put me out of business. I said, well, what do you mean? Well, he proceeded to tell me that he used to be a sign painter in Chicago. He painted all sorts of billboards and murals and water tanks and big signs. And when computer graphics came out, he was just left behind. People, people started using computers to generate graphics and print them out instead of using painters who painted them by hand. Because computers, of course, could do it faster, they could do it better, and they could do it cheaper than, than hand sign painters. And pretty soon, he found himself out of work. So now, he drives a cab, making a lot less money than he used to. And that's exactly what I want to prevent from happening to you. I want you to keep up with technology and advance your careers rather than let than, than get let behind, left behind. So don't let computers put you out of business. And with that, I'd like to leave you with these parting words. You hold your own future in your hands. So thank you all very much. Great. Richard, thank you very much. Uh, we did have a, we've got a couple of minutes left before Richard has to run. Um, I've got a couple of questions here that I've got, and I'd uh, just like to throw them by you, Richard, and see if you could field them for us. Sure. Um, sure. First question you. is, um, would 3DS Max 9 be a good program to know in this industry? That's asked Absolutely. by Jacob. Absolutely, Jacob. I've seen some really incredible renderings and animations done with 3D, 3D Studio Max. A friend of mine up in Dallas named uh, Bill Strother is a lighting designer, and he's an expert in 3D Studio Max. And he gets a lot of good jobs uh, because he knows how to use that program very well. Now, he starts off in AutoCAD, then he imports that model. He builds a 3D model in AutoCAD, and he imports that into 3DS and he, uh, and he adds all the materials and does the animation and the photorealistic rendering in 3, 3D Studio Max. So yes, I would highly recommend that. OK, great. Thank you. Um, Travis asks, in a church setting, what have you found is the best way to structure a team for lighting and set building? Kind of a little bit off our topic, but do you have any thoughts on that one, Richard? Yeah, that's a, that's a little bit of a challenging one because the, the vast majority of churches use volunteers and they tend to come and go. But the key is to find people who are passionate, find people who really enjoy doing it and that they're doing it uh, because you know they love to do that. And uh, once you lock in on those people, and then you're set. You know, you can pretty much hand them the keys and, and let them go, and they'll do very well. If you're having trouble finding those people, then it, you know it's just a numbers game. You've got to keep uh, searching and keep searching. So that's that would be my recommendation: is to try to find somebody who's passionate. Okay. I hope that answers your question. 
Um, we have some que uh, requests for sending out slides or uh, whether this is going to be available. We are going to post this entire presentation, both the audio and the video, on our website as soon as we finish compiling it and do a, just a quick edit. But that will be available for you as a, uh, a podcast. So you can just come back to the uh, Creative Stage Lighting uh, website, and that will be available to you some, sometime in the near future. Um, Derek asks, Richard, I see your slides are copyright 2007. How many times have you presented this previously? <laughs> well, this, uh, this started as a presentation that I did to the sales staff uh, at Creative Stage Lighting last year. And I, um, it morphed into a different presentation that I presented with PLSN uh, on a PLSN webinar one time. And this would be the, uh, I guess, second or third generation. But you know, since then, a lot of things have changed, even since last year. So it's a, um, it's a growing, living, breathing thing. You know. Yeah. What I can say is, I, I saw this last year, and Richard was primarily talking about the state of the industry and the rapid changes and how we needed to adjust for that. And the thing that I thought had tremendous value here today was, uh, you know, really given some concrete steps on how to build your career path in this industry. So I, I think that was a really great job, and, and I think we all appreciate that very much, Richard. Um, got a couple more questions here. Um, Ivan wants to know, how are architects influencing the, the current uh, entertainment lighting business? Any, is it good, bad, any disadvantages? Well, Ivan, uh, my experience with architects is that uh, lighting design, unfortunately, in a lot of situations, is an afterthought. And I've had to come in and uh, kind of fix things. You know, you'll, you'll find, uh, for example, you'll find air conditioning ducts running over the platform or over the stage area, or you'll find that they didn't allocate enough power, and then you've got to go in and do damage control. Uh, I'd really like the architects to become more aware of, of um of theatrical lighting and lighting design so that they understand that they need to involve the lighting designer very early in the process. So what I'm finding is that that, is, that isn't always the case. There are a few enlightened architects out there, and when you, when you find them, latch on to them because they're, they're rare. They're rare birds. Um, but they, the other way I think that they're influencing what we do is, uh, of course, these days everybody's very aware of green building and green green design and their the lead design. Um, so you know, people are looking for um, lighting designers who understand some of the alternative lighting light sources like T5 fluorescence, compact fluorescence, where you can use them, where you can't use them, LEDs, and even source fours. I've used source fours as uh, source four pars as house lights, and I saved one church um, something on the order of $27,000 a year by doing so. Um, but you know, the architects these days are also looking for ways to save energy. So they're using more natural light, um, and, they're, and they're looking for ways to integrate uh, daylighting with the, with the environment. And that becomes challenging then, because now you've got to control the daylighting. So um, that's, those are the two primary ways, I think, that architects are influencing what we do today. Great. Richard, uh, Dara asks, um, would you recommend working for the bands directly or for lighting companies? Sorry, who asked this? Dara. Dara, OK. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, Dara, uh, it really depends on the situation. Um, I personally have never worked directly for a band. I've, I've, the tours I've done have always been through a production company. Um, th there are certain production companies who will take very good care of you. I, I, um, I think um, you know there, there are some that give you like a health package and that type of stuff. Um, those are good production companies to get involved with. On the other hand, there are certain bands that are led legendary in how well they take care of their crew. For example, the Grateful Dead was like that. They, I, I think they had the same crew for about 30 years, and that's because they treated them so well. And I, I've heard stories that the crew used to ride the gigs in limos, and the crew used to sub-hire crew, and so they, would, uh, they wouldn't even show up to the gig. They'd still get paid, and the job would still get done. You know? So it just depends on the situation. Okay, we've only got time for just a couple more here. Uh, Jennifer wants to know is, how can we as professionals influence the criteria 
of, uh, of college classes to include current technology, software, boards, media, ser media servers, et cetera? Oh, that's an excellent question. And unfortunately, I don't think there's a clear-cut answer to that, because the bottom line is that, that uh, colleges do what is economically in their own interest, and which is understandable. Otherwise, they wouldn't be around. So um, you know, um, there are there are I've seen high school performing art centers that charge to use their facilities, and that has paid for moving light systems and the latest boards and consoles. So maybe you can pitch them, uh, you know, money making ideas so that they can generate revenue to pay for the gear. Beyond that, I think um, if you're already enrolled in a college, at a particular college, and they don't have the gear, then perhaps you should look around for some. There are lots of colleges out there that actually have the gear. You know, if you're studying theater, um, uh, I think UNLV is a good theater, has a really good theater tech program. Um, and, you know, there, there's, a, there's a handful of colleges that really get it and they are using current gear and current consoles, and you just have to find those ones. Yeah, Ford, Ford out there actually volunteered. He's a college instructor, and he said, just ask me, and I'll teach a class. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Ford is, um, gosh, Ford, I know you're in upst upstate New York, but I can't remember now where you teach, and I apologize for that. It's been a while since we've spoken, but, uh, uh, yeah, get, get a hold of Ford. Yeah, and, and Ivan wants to know if there's any best colleges for training on current technologies. Well, that depends on what you want to do. If you want to be a theater major, then there's some recommendations. If you want to be a rock and roll touring guy, there's, there's other recommendations. Um, so uh, um, there's, a, um, there's a, an article I just wrote for about.com, internships. Kevin, do you know that link? Offhand, is it internship dot about? Oh, am I? It's about dot com, and then under um, careers, there's a section called internships. And actually, that's <laughs> thank you very much for that. That's actually a, a, a blatant tag of my my wife actually writes for about dot com, <laughs> and she does internships there. And one of the things she tries to do is help point people in the right direction in terms of classes, as well as. Um, you know where where there might be the best corporate kind of internships, or if there are lighting companies that are sponsoring internships. So the one thing that I would recommend is check out about.com, go to careers, and check out internships. And um, you know, Penny can give you some information there and point you in the right direction. Yeah, and I just wrote an article about uh, for her, and it's posted up online that, that talks specifically about that. So uh, go check out that article, and uh, and that should answer some of your questions. Yeah, and anybody that's interested, just send a request to uh, webinar at creativestagelighting.com, and we'll make sure we get you that link as well. Okay. Um, I think we get time for just one more question. Um, how do you comp okay, The question is from Rick. Uh, how do you compromise production and dollars and still be able to show your business quality and get larger jobs without? Ah, uh, well, that's the million dollar, the million dollar <laughs> question. That's why I figured we'd wrap up with that one. <laughs> yeah, that's called value engineering, and I've never really found a satisfactory way to do that. Uh, the, the one trick that I have learned is that when you do your design, um, don't, don't include um, just automated and conventional. Always throw in some, some color wash fixtures, some scrollers, or what have you, because the first thing that they're going to do is they're going to cut back on the number of automated lights, because they think that's eye candy, they think it's not necessary. So if you get rid of some of your, if you pair back your automated lights, then you then you have less um, color, and uh, you know so that that really hurts. So I, I don't think there's a good solution to value engineering. Just just pad it as much as you can would be my recommendation. Okay. All right. Well, we we have other questions out there right now, but unfortunately we're out of time for today. I um, want to thank Richard again um, for, for spending his time here with us today. Uh, some great information, Richard. Uh, as we mentioned, this is going to be an ongoing series. Uh, we'll make sure we keep all of you in the queue as far as upcoming events. Feel free to invite your, uh, your colleagues, uh, you know, friends in the industry, because uh, I think we're going to have a lot of additional uh, really value to add as we, as we go down the road. Uh, and again, any questions that we didn't get to today, if you want to send those questions to uh, webinar at creativestagelighting.com, uh, we'll do our very best to, to try to get answers for those for you.
Well, thank you very much, everybody. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay. Guys. Thank you, Richard, and thanks, everybody. We appreciate you being here today, and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Take care.